bear with me as I start. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, so very good morning to all of you, our service here this morning. Uh, let's make a slow start, shall we? Uh, this is not how we normally meet, but for now this is perhaps the new normal of the way we meet as a church family and for our morning services as well as evening services here on, on Zoom and here at Rock Baptist Church. My name is Bobby Abraham. I'm one of the many members of this church, uh, very much rooted and grounded in God's word here at Rock. The Bible we have uh, with us is really meant to speak to God's truth and for us to recognize it. We do have people from around the world that have joined us through many of our Sunday services here on Zoom. Uh, I think as far as from Iran, from France, from Australia even, China and even India. Uh, if you're a guest here this morning, uh, I want to just say a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. We're going to have a time of singing this morning. We're going to read God's word. We're also going to hear a short message from Matt Peckham, one of our leaders here at Rock Baptist Church. We've been studying the Ten Commandments over the last several weeks, and this is the bit that we're going to do for later. But for now, uh, we're going to uh, very much look to God's word. Uh, what we always do as a church family is to come together and praise and honor our God. We have so much to be thankful for. The sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, reminding us of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. He is a faithful God, and he is at the center of who we are as a church and all that we do. We're going to start with a Bible reading from 1 John 1. Uh, we normally use the International Children's Bible for the children's reading at the start. So I'm going to hand off to the Duke girls. If you're there, please come off mute, nice and loud, and take it away. One John one verses five to seven. Here is a message we have heard from God and now tell to you. God is light and in him there is no darkness. So if we say that we have fellowship with God, but we continue living in darkness, then we are liars. We do not follow the truth. God is the light. We should live in the light too. If we live in the light, we share fellowship with each other. And when we live in the light, the blood of the death of Jesus, God's son, is making us clean from every sin. Thank you. Shall we just bow our heads together and pray? Father, we want to thank you for this morning for being a faithful God. In you, Father, there is light and there is no darkness at all. And we just want to praise and worship and honor your name this morning. We pray particularly for each and every one of us as a church family and just during these dark times that the world sees it, we are grateful that in you we can have our hope and you're a faithful God. You're an unchanging God yesterday, today, and forever. Bless our time this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to start with a nice song. The children can join along. So uh, you can go away and mute and sing out loud. He 
never lied Was always righteous before all eyes He is the hero that we need A man of justice He's the son of God And you know his name There is power in Jesus' name. This is for the children, so if you guys can come closer to your keyboards and get ready. If I gave our children, Jordan and Mia, who are here today, 10 pounds and asked them to look after it really, really well when I'm going away on a few months of a work trip, what do you think they should do with it? Option A, bury it in the ground and keep it safe. Invest it with some sound advice from a wealth manager. Spend it on what Mia loves, Jammy Dodgers, and Jordan loves Monster Munch. Or option D, take mom to lunch. Okay. You can see the answers coming in. The Mercers say B, Jojo and Lydia, C. Jordan thinks it's B, Jordan and Mia thinks it's B. Well done. Duncan McIntyre says D, take mom to lunch. Very good, she makes a lot of the sacrifices. And uh, the Horton say B, the Rowell say C. Okay, I'm gonna uh, try and understand this a little bit better, but uh, Definitely those who chose B was the right answer 
invested with sound advice from a wealth manager. Let's hear out why. So, okay, girls and boys, there is a quiz at the end of this, so listen carefully. And you adults as well, the clever ones, you've got to listen as well. So this is now going to be your chance to have a go at the end. But for now, this is a very, very familiar story that we all know and have heard many, many, many times, the good worker. So the parable of the talents. Jesus told a story about a boss who gave his workers some money to use for him while he was going to be away. Take this money to make more money for me, he said. One man got one coin, another man got two gold coins, and the best worker got five gold coins. Use these well until I get back, said the boss. The best worker with five coins, what did he do? He bought and sold things with the money and made five more coins for his boss. The man with two coins also used them very well. But the lazy man, what did he do? With one gold coin, he dug a hole and buried it in the garden where it was of no use to anyone. I will leave it here until my boss comes back, he thought. Finally, guess what? Their boss came back to see what they had done with this money. The man with five coins had made five more. The man with two coins had made two more. Well done, said the boss. You are good workers. Now you can be the boss of others. Well done, good and faithful servant, is what he said. You've been faithful in a few things, and I'll put you in charge of many more things. Enter into the joy of your master. The lazy man said, I hit the gold because it isn't fair if you hit me the hard work that I put in. Even in the bank, my money would grow, said the boss. Go away. You're a lazy man. You should have deposited my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10. For the one who has will be given more, and he will have more than enough. It is important to do your best with what God has given to us. Can we use our talents for God and for Jesus one day? And Jesus saying to us, well done, good and faithful servant. So get ready for the questions. Why was the boss happy when he returned? Option A, he was glad to see them after a while. Option B, he found two good managers. Option C, he found money dug up in the back garden. The Mercers say B, he found two good managers. The Peckhams say D, he found money dug up in the garden. That's always a treat if you find some money. Uh, Jojo and Lydia say C, very good, finding money in the garden. The Abrahams kids say B, the McIntyre say D, the Hottons say B. Okay, that's plenty of answers. All right, what is the right answer? Why was the boss happy when he returned? He was, of course, glad to see them, but the right answer is that he found two good managers, two people who were diligent with what God had given to them. Okay, next one. How many coins did the second man have when the boss came back? Option A, two. Option B, four. Option C, 22. So how many coins did the second man have when the boss came back? Okay, that seems like an easy one. You're seeing plenty of answers of B. Very good. Okay, so now for all of you clever ones, this is a really good question. Let's try this out. What was the capital infusion into this project by the boss? Was it A, 10 coins? Was it B, bitcoins? Was it C, eight coins? Let's see the answers for that. You've also got some time for the next question, which is what is the return on capital employed, the ROC percentage at the end by the boss? Was it 
Was it 50%? Was it 187.5%? Come on, guys. You can do this. Okay. The Marshalls say eight. Peckham say 10. Mike says he needs to ask Jonathan. The Dukes have C and F. Okay. Very clever. Jojo and Lydia, C and F. Well done. The Hortons say F. Very good. Okay. So let's, let's look at this. So why, what is the capital infusion uh, into this project? Was it 10 coins? Was it bitcoins? Or was it eight coins? So we see very clearly the capital infusion was one plus two plus five, that's eight. And then return on capital employed, very much the right answer is 187% because the profit before interest, tax and dividends was 15. Total assets were eight. Current liabilities was zero. We've assumed 0% tax. And therefore, the return on capital employed is 187.5%. Fantastic. Very, very clever church. Thank you. OK. Now, this is an exercise you could do this afternoon, children, as you have your Sunday roast. Normally, for me as an Indian, I'd eat a chicken biryani, which is a nice savory lunch, savory rice with lots of chicken or lamb in it. But here it's a Sunday roast. So as you have that this afternoon, perhaps something to discuss around the table. What are the three talents that God has given you that you can put to use to make the boss happy? Perhaps it's a discussion you can think about. What are the talents? Has God given you 5, 10, 20 innumerable talents? What are they? Do you recognize them? Can you have a chat about it as a family? And God's word says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. That's in Luke, both passages. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much more. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So a lot to think about this morning, that we can be faithful to God in all the talents, in all the things that he has entrusted us in our hands. Okay, so we're going to cut over into uh, the next section. Uh, this is Paul and Catherine Hunt. We're going to get to know them a little bit better. Paul and Catherine, if you are there on screen, yes, I can see you. Very good. Through the lockdown period, we've welcomed many new folks to rock, and joining us today are Paul and Catherine Hunt. So, Paul and Catherine, many thanks for joining us over the last few months in our Zoom services. Can you tell us a little bit more about you, Catherine and Paul? Yes, we, um, we've uh, been together for 10 years and we got married just over two years ago. Mm -hmm. And this is Bethany, who is six months old this week. Yeah. Fantastic. Hello, Bethany. Lovely uh, to see you all. <laughs> yeah, lovely to see you, thank you. Um, so tell us a little bit more about you, Paul and Catherine. So Catherine is a vet who is currently working, when well, she's not on maternity leave, uh, she's working at the Sanger Institute on uh, finishing a PhD that we started in Malawi. Um, Catherine was collecting samples from households investigating salmonella and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's best I describe it because uh, you give I, I don't really understand it, <laughs> all the details. Um, so we both went there, and while we were there, we found a evangelical church and some excellent missionaries and some lovely local people who'd set up a church, and it really uh, brought us to the idea of looking for a church with strong community, home groups and teaching, a gospel-based church. Um, and that, so we were able to find a Rock Baptist when we came back, and it's exactly the type of community that we were looking for, especially with Bethany now. Oh, for myself, I work for the council. I'm a town planner, and uh, I play a lot of rugby. That's, that's most of my time that's not wrapped up with Bethany. Yeah, so Lovely. it's really been nice to join you guys since about June time. So thanks for having us. Fantastic. A very warm welcome to uh, all three of you, Paul, Catherine and Bethany. Uh, tell us, how have you found our morning Zoom services? Um, really accessible, actually, um, and really 
uh, we were on Zoom actually before, while we were, when we do, we didn't ever thought we'd be doing that. Um, but especially the children's stuff and the stories and the descriptions, we've really enjoyed. And um, the breakout groups at the end, it's been really nice to interact with people, even though a lot of you we haven't met in person mm -hmm. or are just starting to meet in person. So, yeah, we found them really useful um, and really helpful for worship as well. That's good. Lovely. Thank you very much for joining us this, joining us this morning. Uh, and as you mentioned, yes, this is a nice time to talk about the reminder at the end of the service, we do have breakout rooms. And hopefully if you've been uh, allocated in one of the uh, Zoom breakout rooms, we'd love to see you guys and uh, know a little bit more about you. So thank you and a warm welcome to you to Rock Baptist Church. Uh, this is also a time when uh, my iCloud photos reminded me of this picture taken exactly a year ago. This was the same weekend last year, this time, that we were away as a church family at Sizewell. And uh, I could see very much the, those rocks on the left side, those pebbles that we took a lovely picture of, is, was so refreshing to just be there. Uh, I think it was a great weekend together as a church family. But also, if you zoom in very close to the center of that picture, there's the Peckhams. It was also their first weekend with us as a church family. And uh, today is also happens to be Matt Peckham's birthday. He's going to be preaching to us later on, but uh, we just wanted to embarrass you a little bit, Matt, and wish you a fantastic, blessed, happy birthday. And we look forward to hearing God's word a little later on. But that is a good timing for me to hand off to you, Matt, to lead on our notices. Great. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you for that. Thank you for embarrassing me there. Um, yeah, very appreciated. Um, welcome to you all. Uh, I can add my welcome. It's good to see you all in little boxes. Paul and Catherine, thank you so much for, for that just now. It was wonderful to hear from you. Um, as Bobby said uh, at the beginning of the service, this is not how we normally meet, but we're getting ever closer to, to getting back to be together. And you probably would have heard that church meetings are not normal, it's not getting back to normal, um, but we are so excited that um, we can, at last, God willing, um, uh, in the next couple of weeks, get back to a physical meeting, a physical service. They're not quite the same, there's no singing, there's no handshaking, um, there's, no any, there's no food and coffee and all that sort of thing afterwards, but the Bible's very clear that as God's people, we are to meet up together. And, and we meet up not socially, but for worship. That's why we, churches are allowed to meet. It's not just social gathering. We can meet back together. And so the, the folks at Mill Road Baptist Church have been so generous to us and that they've allowed us to hire their building, which they're not using in the mornings at the moment. Now, if we want to know more about this, we're going, there's going to be a church meeting on Wednesday, on Wednesday. So that at 8, 30, 8 to 8.30, uh, we would normally have the members meeting. We still will. We'll do member type things, bits of finance, that sort of thing. But 8.30, it, this will be on Zoom, this room that you're in now. Do join, do, do join all of you, um, whether you're members or not, because we'll be talking about resuming services face to face again. And so there's a lot of detail, as you can imagine. Uh, to go through and to talk about that. But we're really excited to do that. And we're going to, we're going to be trialing that um, next week on October the 4th, whereby we'll have a, a Zoom service, um, but it will be from Mill Road. And we'll work out some technical um, bits and bobs and try to make that work for us. And then the following Sunday, God willing, we will be able to meet together for the first time in a long time. So uh, really good, really good news. So please, Please join us on, on Wednesday, uh, either at 8 or 8.30, uh, and we'll find out uh, a lot more about that. Perhaps one more notice just to add is that we'll be meeting back again at 4 o'clock, and we're finishing our series in 2 Peter. So do join us again here uh, this afternoon. It'd be really great to see you. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Matt. Uh, this, uh, uh, yes, you remind, that's a great reminder for the Band of Brothers uh, that we're going to be looking at this afternoon. But uh, this is perhaps the right time uh, in the service where the children can go off to do their Sunday school bits and uh, for the adults who are going to stay on. 
uh, we're going to be <clears throat> looking at uh, uh, reading God's Word together, and uh, I'm going to uh, hand off to John, and John's going to read from uh, Matthew chapter 5, and John, I'd also request you to pray after this for Matt, for his birthday, for, his, for him leading us through yeah. the message later on, uh, also for the hunts uh, as they uh, experience the joy of fellowship with us as a church family. So over to you, John. Thank you. Um, we're going to read from Matthew uh, chapter 5 and verse 27. And this is the subject of Matt's sermon today. It's in our series on the commandments, and it is on committing adultery. You shall not commit adultery. So this is the reading. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now we pray. First we pray for our church fellowship. Uh, we pray for people who are new to our fellowship, particularly for the hunts. We thank you for them coming. And we pray that we can celebrate together. We can celebrate Matt's birthday, and we're very pleased with that. And we pray that he'll have a really happy day. And we pray for what he is to preach about. The Psalms are filled with uh, verses which say, how faithful you are as our God. Many reminders. For God, for great is your love, higher than the heaven. Your faithfulness reaches the skies, one of the psalmists says. And our hearts reach out to you in praise because you are a faithful God. Your promises never fail. Your word endures forever. You are totally dependent. A mighty rock a strong fortress, and we praise your name because you are a faithful shepherd who saves lovingly. And he calls us to be faithful stewards as well. Um, and we pray that we will be faithful in all our ways, in our homes, in our families, in our work, in our businesses, with our friends, and as we interact with other people. And we pray for our integrity and that it will shine out as a light to those around us. But society, very sadly, the word being unfaithful means something very particular. It's so much the norm in society today for people to be unfaithful. So many broken homes, so many damaged children. And we regret this. We say to you, Lord, that we are so sad in our hearts that this should be very much the norm. And we pray that the standards of society may change. And loving God, we reach out to you and we call on you to restore the world. We pray for society and for a broken world. And what we pray for society, we pray for ourselves we realize that we are not immune from temptation. And Jesus challenges us even in our thoughts as we read in that passage. And so we pray for protection. We pray that you will reach out and forgive us. And in some of us, such things are painful. And we pray that you will heal our wounds and forgive us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, John. So we're going to uh, turn to scripture. I'm going to hand off to Matt Peckham. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, John. Um, 
as, as Bobby's mentioned, we, took a, we took, took a break last week from our series in the Ten Commandments last week. But this week we're back to the Seventh Commandment, stated simply, you shall not commit adultery. And we've seen in our reading and we've thought about even in our prayers that Jesus takes this commandment very seriously. He applies it to our hearts, not just to what we do, but how we think and feel. But we also mustn't elevate it above any other sin above in our lives uh, of lying and hatred and the other things that Jesus talks about. But as we begin, it is worth noting, isn't it, and being honest up front, that um, these are sensitive issues. And as John has already prayed, they've touched all of us in, in different ways uh, and our society. And I imagine there isn't many of us here um, who haven't known um, hurt um, up close in some way. Now, I can't pretend to know all of our circumstances, but I do know that, that we're all in this together. Me, with you, coming to the Lord Jesus to be taught by him. So let's pray and we'll look at this passage together. Father God, we thank you, um, as John has already prayed, that um, uh, you teach us and you care for us and forgive us. And we pray that we would um, think well together and listen to you together, to be both humbled and encouraged by the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, if we um, look at the slide on your screen, you may be able to see uh, an image there. I don't know if that's... Uh, possible. There it is. Um, you might have seen something similar to this. It's a kind of greeting card, uh, mean thing that, that's gone around, probably apocryphal that this actually happened. And here is a couple, an older couple, and the line at the top says, how have you managed to stay together for so long? And the answer at the bottom there, it's simple really. Um, we were from a time where if something is broken, we fix it, not throw it away. Now, I suppose we might think that that represents something positive. It does in a way, doesn't it? We, we would love to see couples faithful and married uh, long into their lives. And it does represent something of faithfulness and lasting marriage. But we have to be honest, it's also a little bit quaint, isn't it? Because th there are some marriages that don't fix. It takes both sides for reconciliation. And there's hurt and there's fallout all throughout our society in this area. I think at the moment of a situation I know uh, where a man has left his wife just before lockdown to spend lockdown with another woman, leaving uh, a hurting wife and confused children. It reminds us of, of, of the ugliness of unfaithfulness in God's world when we come across things like that. And not only is our society confused about these issues, but it, it pulls in the other direction, doesn't it? So we, we buy the newspaper for the supplement on the royal wedding, and then we turn to the gossip pages to see who's left who. In fact, early on in lockdown, there was, I think, much more conversation about um, how TV producers can bring intimacy back onto screens again and film it than there was conversation about couples being able to get married. And in a way, we are bearing the fruit of the 1960s free love movement, that sort of culture. And our society has lowered the value of sex. It's, the premium is so low, it's perhaps best summed up with the word consent. It doesn't matter what you do as long as it has consent. But the wide ranging license to, to do whatever, um, well, it doesn't seem to bring joy and it doesn't seem to bring a stable society or mental well being. And Jesus wants us to see this morning that kingdom people are to live in radical faithfulness. And as he puts it at the end of his sermon on the Mount, we are to be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect. And Jesus wants to protect us from that harm that we've seen all around us. So we're going to think about this passage under two headings. Um, firstly, we need to acknowledge it's a battle of the heart. The Jesus here is speaking on the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew's Gospel, and he's talking about kingdom values. So he's talking about people to people in the kingdom. 
So we acknowledge, don't we, it's not an out there problem, out in the big bad world that we stand in judgment over. It's not. And here Jesus affirms the law and he has said earlier that he has not come to abolish the law but to fulfill the law. So just as in Exodus God rescued a people and he brought them to the mountain and Moses on the mountain uh, gave the people God's rules and values of how to live in that kingdom, so here is Jesus on a mountain has, he has come to rescue his people, and he's telling us that we live in the same way. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Jesus stands by that, and it's wrong because it's contrary to the way that God has designed marriage and the truths about God and his world. A world in which he created Adam and Eve for monogamous, heterosexual, sexual intimacy as a couple that that would be the only place for that intimacy and more than that it's contrary to God himself who is perfectly and radically faithful and so our culture um, in, a, in abusing sexual intimacy and unfaithfulness it takes the good gifts of God and uses them to tell a lie about him and his world and so firstly, we might simply say that we, we should guard marriage. Those of us that are married should guard our marriages. And not only for those of us who are married, but those in the church family. We should, we should help as a community. We should value and take marriage seriously. And as Christians being married, we display the character of God. When I was an art director and I used to work um, in advertising, uh, every single piece of creative work uh, that I would do or anyone in the creative department would do uh, has to be run by the creative director. It has to come under his nose. There has to be a meeting. And the purpose of that is that the creative director has the sole authority on what goes out from the agency creatively because their reputation stands on it. So any bit of work that I did has to have that stamp. Because if, if an advert goes out there or, or a picture or something creative, people know that it comes from that agency and it has the agency's name on it. And so it had to be of the very best quality. And so it is with Christian marriage. Every married couple as a Christian reflects God and his faithfulness and the relationship of the Lord Jesus to the church. Every Christian marriage has God's name on it. And so we'll need to guard our marriages. We'll need to be intentional. It will mean that we have to have the how are we doing conversations. It will mean knowing that loving is also listening. It will mean turning the telly off now and again. It will mean knowing that we should have the husband and wife dynamic as the primary one in our household and not merely relating as mum and dad. And Jesus helps us to see how he takes that law even more seriously. We read, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus is not really me merely reinstating the law. He's opening it up further to us. And just as uh, the Lord Jesus did with the commandment not to murder a couple of weeks ago that we saw, Jesus internalizes the law. And so we saw that it's not good enough for us just to say, well, I've not killed anyone. Jesus points out that the root of murder is hatred and anger. And just as hatred and anger is, is the seed for murder, so the seed of adultery is lust. And Jesus is concerned with our heart. And it's clear, I hope, that, that Jesus isn't merely restricting his teaching here to men who are married. 
but we do need to be absolutely clear about what the Bible means by lust and sexual immorality. Because our fallen nature, it's always asking when we come up against the law, isn't it? What, what can I get away with? What, what doesn't count in the law? And as we read through the rest of the New Testament, we see particularly the Apostle Paul um, spelling that out for us. So in 1 Timothy, where he's talking um, about the ungodly and unrighteous, he goes through this second part of the law. He talks about murdering and lying, and he talks about the sexually immoral and those who practice homosexuality and those who lie, and so the list goes on. But further to that, in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul uh, says this in 1 Corinthians. He says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were brought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. So can you see whether we are married or not? Well, we belong to God and we honour him with our bodies. And the word that Paul uses there, sexual immorality, is the Greek word porneia, from which we get the word pornography. And so we can see how wide uh, reaching this command is. But let's look, at, look down at the wording there in, Ma in Matthew 5. Jesus says, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And what Jesus is talking about here is the look in order to lust. And it's worth remembering at this point that temptation is not a sin. It's the giving into it, isn't it? So it means, it means that if I catch something in my eye walking down the street pinned up in a telephone booth, it means that I walk on and not stop and turn again to look in order to lust. It means not looking in order to desire and satisfy thoughts, fantasy, affections, desiring for the sake of lust and satisfaction and being unfaithful, that is what God is talking about. And it's a vision, isn't it, of, of radical faithfulness. Even the most fervent Me Too sensibilities, even with those, the world has a long, long way to go to catch up with the standard of Jesus in matters of sexual purity. And the world is inconsistent in this, and it lies to us. And we must remember that we're in a constant tug of war for our imaginations. And we're being lied to about the value of sex and its place. And, and this is no more prevalent than in, in pornography, as, an, as just one example. It promises commitment, and yet it snares people in addiction. It promises no commitment, and yet it snares people in addiction. It promises intimacy and acceptance and yet it brings alienation and it promises enjoyment but it so often leads to self-loathing and it's highly destructive. So preteens or teenagers exposed to pornography they may suffer marital issues years on and, and the male gaze that objectifies women infiltrates our society whether it be um, children's clothing range on the high street or a dance routine on Britain's Got Talent. It finds its way in. But not all temptations in this area are, are obvious. One other thing that we are constantly fed, drip fed, by TV is, is adultery bringing happiness. And it's very subtle. So many um, stories that we interact with are geared around the happiness and we, we are manipulated to get on board with the resolution of that character arc that will be resolved if only she gets with him or he gets with her or whatever it may be. And it may not be a particularly graphic temptation 
a woman who is noticed and flattered by a good looking man paying her attention will need to resist then wondering what it might be like married to them instead of their own husband. That's true of the daydreaming single woman. And all of these things that which we're presented with are, are lies and, and the devil uses those lies. It's a simple bait and switch. It's so tempting and looks good, but it brings death. Proverbs 5 puts it this way. The lips of the adulterous woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. For her paths wander aimlessly, but she does not know it. And so here is some father son advice to a, to a young uh, uh, preteen son, probably in the context, painting a picture that adultery and immorality looks good. It, it drips with honey, but it leads to death. And Jesus says that we should take this battle of the heart seriously. Uh, on your screen, you might be able to see a, a picture of a guy called Aaron Ralston. Some of you may know this story that in April 2003, uh, Aaron Ralston was in the Canyonlands National Park uh, where, when he, where a boulder fell on him, trapping both of his arms. And he freed his left, his left arm. And here he is um, talking to, to an interviewer about what he had to do. You might know this story. He decided to cut off his own arm to free it from the boulder. And it said, he said he tried every method he could think of, including chipping away at the rock with the knife, before concluding that the only option was actually severing my arm below the elbow. So this, this is what he says. Essentially, I got my surgical table ready and applied the knife to my arm. And I started sawing back and forth. I didn't even break the skin. I couldn't even cut the hair off my arm. The knife was so dull. Later, he said, he got so far as to puncture the skin and then found that I couldn't cut the bone, essentially knowing that you can't cut the bone without a bone saw. By Thursday, I'd figure out an option around that. I was able to first snap the radius and then within another few minutes, snap the ulna at the wrist. And from there, I had the knife out and applied the tourniquet and went to task. It was a process that took about an hour. That, oh, that's gory stuff. Is I'm really squeamish, so I can't, I can't read any more than that. And it does go on. But this is exactly the imagery that Jesus is using to take our sin seriously. So Jesus goes on in verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. So just as with Aaron Ralston, keeping the arm might lead to death. If that's going to lead to death, it is better that you cut it out, that you strip sin away. And Jesus knows that we're in a battle for the heart. And he wants us not to love the sin that we have. And so what he's saying is we've got to take it that seriously. So we do have to ask ourselves, don't we? Do we take lust of the heart this seriously? Or do we entertain it? Do we dabble with it? Do we skirt around the edges? Do we daydream of a different husband? Do we secretly covet another person's relationship? Do we accidentally on purpose click on that link? Jesus says we're to give no rope and no leeway, no thin end of the wedge to anything that will give rise to infidelity, to unfaithfulness. And the root really is our disordered desire, a disordered desire that's rooted in a dissatisfaction 
with God, dissatisfied with what he's given us. And do you remember that we, we saw a couple of weeks ago, as we've been going through the, the Ten Commandments, that, that those first four, looking at our vertical relationship, if you like, with God, is very much connected to that horizontal relationship with each other. So as we love God more, we're able to love one another better. And so we are to reorder our desires to love the Lord our God. And what Jesus teaches here with, with those gory pictures is, is a picture of a repentant heart. It's not a handbook for kingdom entry. These commandments are not given to get us into heaven, but to get heaven into us. It's a kingdom way of living. We've been saved for, for a radical faithfulness, um, which he, the Lord Jesus, comes along to help us in. You remember, he teaches us to pray. Father, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. And so radical faithfulness, it might mean choosing not to watch certain things that other people are fine with. Radical faithfulness might be the husband who is committed to desiring his wife as the sole place for all sexual thought activity and companionship. Radical faithfulness might not be giving any rope to desiring anyone else. Resisting a temptation to put a husband or wife down when they're not there, even despite their shortcomings. It might be the faithfulness to forgive and to commit in the face of unfaithfulness. To love as God would have us love and to forgive as we've been forgiven. Because love is a choice. But we can probably see, can't we, at this stage, that what we need is a change of heart. If the only reason that I don't watch porn is because I have a blocker on my internet, if my obedience is merely circumstantial, well, there's still more work that God needs to do on my heart. And so secondly, and a bit more briefly, we'll look at the victory of the king, because that's what we need to look at the victory of the king, the Lord Jesus, because the heart abhors a vacuum. We can't just cut away bad desire and leave it at that. It needs to be filled with good desire. We need to love radical faithfulness. And we know that faithfulness is good. When we see a couple that have been married for so long, even perhaps when we hear wonderful stories of a, of a faithful dog, for example, it, it, you know that faithfulness is beautiful, it's courageous, it's noble, it's strong, it's a godlike way to live. And if we want to see radical faithfulness, we must look at our God. In the book of Hosea, one of the prophets, um, God uses the picture of adultery, a woman and a man, to explain to the prophet Hosea and to to use that in his life to preach God's faithfulness. And so Hosea is married to a promiscuous woman. But God says this in Hosea 3, chapter one, uh, verse 1. The Lord said to me, go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. And the big point here is that God's radical faithfulness is to the undeserving, to the unfaithful. And perhaps that can be an encouragement to any of us who've been at the receiving end of unfaithfulness in any way. We are to be faithful regardless. And, and when that hurts and is hard, well, we cry out to the Lord. He specialises in being faithful to the unfaithful. And ultimately, we look to the Lord Jesus for that victory of the king that we share being united with him. It's really struck me reading this and trying to imagine the scene that as Jesus is there, he's on the mountain and there are thousands of people gathered there. And here he is, uh, a Middle Eastern Jewish man in the first century, 30 something years old 
preaching this. And that wouldn't go down at all, would it, if any other human being were to stand up and say, well, it's not good enough not to murder. You, what really is, matters is the heart. Do not hate people. And yes, don't commit adultery, but don't lust in your heart. How can a man stand up and say those things? Here is Jesus, a red-blooded young man in his 30s, and he can say it because he practices what he preaches. Unlike any of us, unlike me, unlike any, any of us. Because Jesus would have been extremely popular, wouldn't he? And yet he never looked at a girl in the marketplace inappropriately. Never once encouraged a relationship in that way. No hint of unfaithfulness, not for a nanosecond. He is radically faithful to his father and to his people so that he can be the perfect sacrifice for our sin. And he does this. It's not easy for him. He doesn't um, keep that faithfulness and perfection just because he's God and it's a breeze. No, he, was, he is human and he is genuinely like us in that way, in his human nature. But not for one second, not for one tiny instance did he fail. And that's how he can stand and teach like this. That's incredible. And that is a victory he gives to us, to his people. That is the faithfulness of Jesus, who, when everyone had run away from him, including his best friend Peter, denying him the night before he dies, Jesus is faithful. And his power he offers to help us because God specializes in being faithful to the unfaithful. So two encouragements as we finish. First of all, there is forgiveness. Later on in Matthew's Gospel, <clears throat> when Jesus is asked by a disciple, how often should we forgive? Seven times? Jesus says, <clears throat> 77 times. Seven being the, the number of completion, perfect. Unceasing forgiveness is what God always offers. It is a promise. And it's really great to hold on to those promises. 1 John 1 verse 9 says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And secondly, there is forgiveness, but there is a future. There's an immediate future, as God can graciously pick us up. There are marriages that survive. And I know firsthand from Christian brothers who have found things like pornography not to be insurmountable with the Lord's help. It is defeatable. So there's a future in the short term, but really there is future in the long term. Because this side of heaven, none of us will be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Not until we see him, but it will happen. When we're given new bodies and radical faithfulness, is guaranteed, it is the guaranteed future for us with the Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus and his extraordinary defeat uh, against sin, that he, that he is a victor, that he defeated sin and the devil. We thank you that he is faithful. We thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that you love faithfulness and we long to um, take this area of our lives seriously. We ask for forgiveness where we've fallen. We ask for grace for you to pick us back up. And we thank you that we are ever secure in your grace and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to, um, <clears throat> going to sing our final song together. So maybe you have that queued up, Bobby. But I just wanted to read this um, verse just as we go in to, to sing this song um, together. This is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. 
Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's sing together. going to end our morning service with the words of grace. Uh, you can come off mute and let us say this together. You can come off mute and let's try together at the count of one, two, three. <laughs> Yeah. And now, and now the grace of Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, the love of, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit be with us all, all, all evermore. Amen. 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 Thank you. Have a wonderful, blessed Sunday. We're going to go into our breakout rooms. It's a great opportunity to meet each other and just spend a few minutes hanging out as a church family. So Keith is going to.